Welcome to Module 10 in the course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. This session is about the eight New Middle East wars and how to understand them, and its relevance to the theme of self-determination should be obvious. As I've written here, nothing abuses the right of a people to self-determination more than a war of aggression. And despite what the propaganda may say, all of the eight Middle New, New Middle East wars possibly nine, if we include Bahrain, have been wars of aggression, and they are, as we know, the mother of all great crimes. I'm going to go through it in these three sections. First of all, to look at the, the great game or the new great game and the project of Washington to create a new Middle East. Secondly, to look at the invasions and dirty wars of the last two decades. And thirdly, to look at the rising axis of resistance in the Middle East, or as it's often more often known these days, West Asia. So a thematic question here is what led Washington in the 21st century to drive so many new Middle East wars? That is to say the ongoing war of ethnic cleansing in Palestine, the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, the invasion of Lebanon, the dirty wars on Libya, Syria and Yemen, and the ongoing low level war of terrorism and an economic war siege against Iran, perceived as the most important of the independent countries of the region. So we have to understand this from the context of the role of or the position, strategic position of the Middle East in relation to a great game these days, which is to do with Washington's fear of Eurasia or the rise of Eurasian power blocks or even multilateral power blocks, and that includes other continents, uh, but particularly Eurasia. So the 21st century Middle East has been the site of these eight Washington-led wars, and they are linked to the plans to dominate a new Middle East and Washington's fears of emerging Eurasian power blocks. Now, Eurasia is, of course, the biggest contiguous land mass with the biggest population on Earth, five and a half billion, most of them in Asia. 70% um, of the total global human population. But since World War II, it's a non-Eurasian power, the USA, that's tried to dominate this supercontinent. And now that that power is in decline, it's concerned about keeping its footholds in both Europe and Asia and having a role over the region. In other words, this is a bigger game than simply uh, gaining access or control of particular uh, oil or particular gas pipelines. It's a bigger game than that. What is this great game? In historical perspective, Washington as a self-styled hegemon in decline faces this new great game, like the great game of the Cold War between the 40s and the late 80s, and the earlier rivalry which coined this term between the British and the Russian empires in the 19th century. In each case, those great games overshadowed or, or rather formed a type of an umbrella for many regional wars. So for example, in the 19th century, the competition between the British and Russian empires led to a range of particular wars or regional wars in Central Asia, in Persia, in India. In the 20th century, the USA or a USA led bloc against the Soviet Union and its um, allies at that time led to that Cold War period, but there were substantial wars during that period, not nuclear wars, but huge wars in Korea, Vietnam, throughout Africa and Latin America. Now in the 21st century, we have this fear, and I'll go on to explain this in a little detail, um, of the US role in the world versus the threat of new power blocks uh, in Eurasia, particularly links between China, Russia, and parts of Europe and other parts of Asia, and including Central and West Asia. So we've had a series of regional wars in the Middle East, in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, ignoring for the time being Africa and Latin America. So looking at this uh, strategic oversight of um, tension and power relations in the world, um, it's been written off many times before. For example, a book by Narendra Singh Sarila, The Shadow of the Great Game, which is about the partition of India, the world's biggest colony um, at the time of decolonization, which was to do with uh, creating a hedge against Soviet influence and keeping the British influence still in that part of the world. This new great game, of course, occurs in the context of US relative economic decline for some decades and its consequences. So now 
Long-term US productivity and trade decline, reducing the US share of the global GDP is rather obvious and has been commented on and discussed many times. But since the late 1960s, which is more or less where we can trace it from, Washington has tried to contain its geopolitical rivals. It's tried to enforce US monopoly privileges and intellectual property rights, very strong intellectual property rights. And with the failure of globalist uh, mechanisms and institutions, including the World Trade Organization, for example, there have been attempts to create globalist type regional blocks in other words, the various so-called free trade blocks, and uh, which are really not so much to do with trade these days, but to do with the privileges of uh, in investors within the US sphere of things. So there's a search for the division and capture of peripheral states all around the world. And that's linked very much to the, the weakening relative economic position of the US against its rivals, it's certainly what it sees as its rivals. So back to a major theme of this course, hegemonic neoliberalism. Uh, at a time of, of US decline, it's not simply an economic technical process, uh, although Anglo-American liberalism has used economic or technical slogans, but there's always been reversion to classical imperial or neocolonial strategies. So the US decline in recent decades has actually enhanced these new colonial elements or rather drawing on old colonial strategies, for example. And they can be seen in attempts to legitimize imperial double standards through globalist integration using extra legal hegemonic stability ideas. Remember this idea of hegemonic stability, the US acting as a global policeman has nothing to do with the norms of the last half century, for example, after the creation of the United Nations, after the, the rule of law and the, the establishment of a cooperative of sovereign states, supposedly coordinated through the United Nations, this idea of an exceptional state, which uh, which is not subject itself to international law, which can act as a global policeman is simply the, something that's always been out of sync with the norms of the post-colonial era. And to try and reconcile the contradictions of that contradiction, uh, great contradiction, we've got these new pretexts of a responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention. Humanitarian intervention is a concept that's been around for a long time since the colonial era in the 19th century. Uh, many of British used it, including British liberals. But the revival of those doctrines is something that's really trying to offset the um, the obvious illegitimacy of these attempts to impose exceptionalist hegemonic plans on the world when we do have a system of international laws based on a cooperative of sovereign states. So what are the geopolitical implications of this US decline? Now, one of the most articulate uh, expressions of this has come through a book written by Zbigniew Brzezinski, a former senior uh, US official, uh, The Grand Chessboard, American Primacy and its Geostrategic Imperatives, written in 1997, um, at a time after the collapse of the Soviet Union and an apparent move towards a unipolar world, that is to say, apparently the US was becoming the dominant power, even though it's economically speaking, it was in decline. In any case, these are the dilemmas uh, posed for US uh, primacy, as Brzezinski puts it. And Brzezinski's book then, although he made some revisions since then, um, and before he passed away, it's the most clearly elaborated US game plan of hegemonic stability theory since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. So how is the US going to face the new challenge of possibly new uh, emerging power blocks, particularly in Eurasia and particularly um, multilateral or multipolarity uh, power blocks, which from the US point of view are regarded as dangerous. Now, as Brzezinski's book is not just a, um, a, a personal account, it reinforces a 1992 Pentagon paper, which called for planning to ensure that no rivals develop. And that include rivals from Germany and Japan, for example, which of course were um, made to submit after the Second World War and incorporated into US power blocks. Islamic fundamentalism wasn't regarded um, by Brzezinski as a great threat because it was generally engaged in diffuse violence and it would not be a problem so long as no geopolitical core developed, in other words, so long as there wasn't um, a coalition of, of Islamic blocs. And that seems 
unlikely because many of those um, states, particularly those with the most sectarian form of religion in the Middle East, are in fact part of the US um, umbrella the, the, or the client states, let's say, particularly Saudi Arabia, but also those other monarchies of the Persian Gulf. The bigger threats were seen from the expansion of the Russian, Chinese and Iranian spheres of influence, particularly in Central and West Asia. And that is uh, how we can see the overriding concern for hegemonic stability um, uh, arguments coming from North America there. They are very concerned to see that no rivals develop in what they would like to be and to remain a one superpower world. Remember, hegemonic stability theory was saying that the supposedly st uh, stabilizing function of the great power was there so long as there was not rivals. And so this is part of this tradition. The threat of Eurasia then and a new Middle East, what is this? So traditional imperial aims have been to control an entire region, dictate the terms of access to others, um, especially in light of now the Russian influence in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and particularly in terms of Chinese, China's expansion, especially through its Belt and Road mega infrastructure network, which is being developed. And you can see in the picture at the bottom right there, the likelihood of strong links being formed between Europe, Russia and China. And you see the, the, the US obsession and concern about the, the gas pipeline from Russia to Germany, for example, now uh, the latest one called Nord Stream 2, for example. This is not just about a gas pipeline and others have been blocked from going through Poland or Ukraine, or now there's a, the possibility of others through Turkey. But the fact is uh, the concern behind that is not just about gas, it's about the creation of new power blocks, new independent power blocks, power blocks independent of Washington's, Washington's controlling hand. Uh, a little background to the, the Belt and Road Initiative. It was proposed by China's president in 2013. It's the world's largest project of connectivity in media in modern times. That belt links China with Southeast Asia, with South Asia, with Central Asia, with Russia and Europe by land. And the road of, of part of the Belt and Road is a sea route connecting China with Southeast and South Asia, East Africa and the Middle East. So you can see this traverses large parts of what is Eurasia and which is something that the US is concerned to see not emerge as a rising power. And of course, it's linked to a technology battle going on too. And you see the um, attempts in the US to try and block or ban or marginalize um, technology leaders coming from China, like Huawei, for example, and the uh, the attempts to get it out of the new 5G technology in various parts of the world. That technological battle is the virtual um, form of this um, jealousy about the formation of new power blocks and leading technologies coming from outside a US controlled power block. Washington's network of control, despite its decline, is still in place. Um, the US is the only country that has hundreds of military bases, around 800 military bases around the world, especially in Europe and the Middle East, but also in East Asia. And of course, Latin America too, but talking about Eurasia, I'm focusing on Europe and, and the Middle East and Asia here. The network is deeply, uh, the US has been deeply networked with European companies, especially through the takeovers and mergers of the 1990s. And that helps explain why it is that the Europeans are so apparently powerless to act independently of the US. That is to say, if they try to sidestep or avoid the so-called sanctions, better term, the unilateral coercive measures imposed on other countries, the US will simply step in and say, well, if you'd rather do business with Iran or Cuba or one of these other countries, then you can forget your business in the US. And so there's that type of bullying, but something which really is uh, able to damage the economic interests of European companies. And of course, the European companies have been fined many times, as I've said in previous uh, modules, uh, for breaching the US unilateral measures against Cuba and Iran in particular. The US is still the dominant player uh, up until now in global media, communications and IT, but it's under challenge and the major challenge is coming from um, China. The US still has a controlling stake in many organizations, including uh, its ability to veto 
uh, in the UN Security Council, particularly vetoes against the actions of apartheid Israel, for example. Um, its power block in the WTO, which is really almost dysfunctional these days, uh, the World Bank and the IMF and other globalist organizations, those things are still important. So while the world may be changing away from a unipolar situation, uh, there are still many elements of the unipolar world that people are living with. The US in its military doctrine it speaks of full spectrum dominance, which means the creation of a force that's dominant across the full spectrum of military operations, persuasive in peace, decisive in war, preeminent in any form of conflict. So that's something that's really sitting behind the military thinking of the US these days, that they are not just looking at military superiority, but they want to maintain that superiority in media, in communications, economically, and so on. Okay, as a background on the great game and previous great games, let's look at this brief um, video called The Great Game and Eurasia. So the pretexts for war are invented to suit grand strategies. Only really naive, the naive accept these pretexts at face value. And in the post-colonial era, all of the interventions into sovereign states are presumed illegal. Only self-defense, genuine self-defense, or UN Security Council collective security resolutions are exceptions. International law is simply not compatible with hegemonic ambitions, and as expressed through this uh, these various wars of the New Middle East. But we should expect great skill in propaganda from the US when it comes to the false pretext for wars of aggression. Remember, the North American Republic conquered territory after territory throughout the 19th century, but never regarded itself as an imperial power, unlike the Europeans, who were quite content to call themselves imperial powers. Most of the founding fathers in the US who wrote of liberty and that all men are equal were themselves slave owners to the day they died, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson in particular. But they certainly had a way with words and uh, it's almost humorous really to see these days many people, including those in former colonies, um, quoting Thomas Jefferson in terms of the ideology of liberty. But when we look at these new Middle East wars, they've used basically three pretexts. The first one is self-defense, like the false claims of uh, an imminent attack from Iraq in the early part of the, the 21st century. Um, secondly, protection, that they are moving in to be the mediators or protectors of other countries from terrorism. Terrorism that they themselves have created, for example, when the US moved back and indeed was invited back into Iraq in 2014, when Iraq was in a very difficult situation with the invasions of, of ISIS. Um, in that case, the pretext was protecting the people of Iraq from ISIS. We know now that, of course, the US was the principal sponsor of ISIS through its clients, such in particular the Saudis in this case. And the third area of pretext is humanitarian intervention, which was most um, 
dramatically exposed in the intervention in Libya in 2011. I'll, I'll come to that in some detail. Methodologically, let's notice here that in examining the various false pretexts for each US-led New Middle East war of aggression, as in any controversy, we've got to consider all sides, but we should pay particular attention to the evidence of admissions against interest as they help resolve polemics and less to self-serving statements. Also, of course, independent evidence where there is independent evidence. As it happens, these wars have been going on for some time now and we do have a great deal of admissions against interest. That is to say, um, admissions aren't necessary to resolve a conflict, but they sometimes make it uh, easier to do that. Now, for reference, I've put in a link to uh, a range of various false pretexts for war in recent year, but I'm not going to spend much more time on it just here. So coming to the invasions and dirty wars of the, the new Middle East project. Um, and here we should start with the ongoing siege and ethnic cleansing of Palestine, the slow motion ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which is failing in many respects in legitimacy, of course, but also in the actual ethnic cleansing because the Palestinian Arab people are now a slight majority in the areas occupied by the Israeli colony. But that's something that's central to these new Middle East wars of the 21st century. We have the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan now for 20 years. Uh, we have almost 20 years, uh, 18 years of the invasion and occupation of Iraq, now unwanted, very clearly unwanted, but remaining there for geostrategic purposes. We have the Israel's failed invasion of Lebanon in 2006. We have the proxy war and the NATO bombing and destruction of Libya in 2011. We have 10 years of proxy wars and occupations in Syria. Um, there is a an uprising which was crushed in Bahrain uh, with the use of Saudi forces in 2011. This is something on the, on the edge of qualifying as a war. And we have the direct and proxy war against the genuine revolution in Yemen, uh, which took place in 2014 and the reaction to it in 2015. And we have an ongoing economic siege, proxy wars, propaganda wars, terrorist wars against Iran, the largest independent state of the region for the last 40 years. The catalyst for the new round of this new round of new Middle East wars was, of course, the infamous terrorist attack in New York in September 2001. And on the official story, most of the plane hijackers were Saudis, but the US decided to invade Afghanistan on the basis that the Taliban government provided sanctuary to Al Qaeda leaders. But the basis for all these wars had been prepared well in advance. So in preparation for the new Middle East wars and the principles involved there in terms of the, the hegemon or the imperial powers perspective was that it was about the destruction of disconnected states and peoples, um, the use of client states, in particular Israel and the Saudis, uh, and the slow ethnic cleansing of Palestine to clear the base for Israel, which was clearly the key lieutenant for Washington in the region. And the base for that has never been seriously challenged, even though from time to time over the past seven decades, the Europeans and uh, in particular Britain and the US, also France and other countries, have made some criticisms of Israel and its ethnic cleansing, but nevertheless, they've never done anything to actually prevent it or to block it. And they've continued to provide weapons for it to be carried out. The Saudis and several other of the, of the Gulf Council cooperation monarchies are also central tools in this plan. A key theme has been the destruction of Arab nationalism, particularly in Iraq and then in Syria, which had been a key factor of the resistance in the region. There had been previous attempts to control Iran, of course, with the coup in the early 50s, the installation of a unpopular monarchy, um, attempts to contain Iraq and various coups um, uh, backed in, in Syria from 1949 onwards, but rather unsuccessful. And even though the US had used Afghanistan's Taliban and Al Qaeda against the Soviet Union and Saddam's Iraq against Iran, that wasn't enough. And we have now an, an important insider, General Wesley Clark, who came out some years ago and exposed the fact that the Pentagon indeed did have a plan for the destruction of seven countries, 
in five years, maybe a bit over optimistic, very over optimistic. But uh, shortly after that, in 2006, in the Israeli colony in Palestine, the declaration of this plan for a new Middle East by the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Let's start off by looking at General Wesley Clark's um, statement about how he came to learn of the plan to, just before the invasion of Iraq, the plan to overthrow the, the governments of seven countries in five years. I went downstairs, I was leaving the Pentagon and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're gonna attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. He said, but um, I guess it's, they don't know what to do about terrorism. And so uh, the, it, they, they think, but they can attack states and they want to look strong. And so I guess they think if they take down a state, it will intimidate the terrorists. And, you know, it's like that old saying he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. Well, I walked out of there pretty upset. And then um, we attacked Afghanistan. I was pretty happy about that. We should have. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. So the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq were both open aggressions on false pretexts. There was no UN mandate in either case. In the case of Afghanistan, um, the invasion was, uh, the pretext was there were delays in handing over suspects for attacks on New York. There was a period of negotiation which broke down with the government, the Taliban-led government of Afghanistan, uh, and that led to the US invasion with some of its allies and the destruction of the state in Afghanistan. In Iraq, it was the falsely claimed weapons of mass destruction, which were about to launch an attack on either the US or Britain um, within a very short period of time. So there followed a, an invasion and destruction of the state. And we saw very strong support from many of the media oligarchs like Rupert Murdoch and, and his uh, media empire, in particular the, the London Times, for example, where uh, various headlines praised the, the attack on Iraq. Even Murdoch even imagined that the price of fuel, the price of petrol was going to go down after that invasion. That, of course, didn't happen. Nevertheless, um, it was such a dramatically uh, aggressive uh, crime that even the Secretary General of the United Nations at that time, Kofi Annan, who was, of course, appointed by the big powers and really doesn't have much genuine independence outside those big powers. But nevertheless, Kofi Annan declared that the invasion and occupation of Iraq was illegal. After the destruction of the Iraqi state or the Ba'athist-led state there, of course, then the UN as a creature of its members and a creature of the big powers in many respects tried to play a role in the um, the stabilization or the the organization of affairs in Iraq under an occupying power but unfortunately after all this time Iraq is still under an occupying power what were the sins of Afghanistan and Iraq against US hegemony well both had exercised too great an autonomy when Washington's ambitions were riding high as I said the destruction of disconnectedness as the US or the Pentagon Doctrine um, spells it out sometime, was too great for the US, that this was a region which could not be allowed to have independence and form new independent relations with other big players, such as Russia, such as Europeans, such as China. 
um, Afghanistan and hesitated to surrender Osama bin Laden, who was apparently a suspect for the terrorist attacks in New York in 2001. Iraq, um, prior to the invasion, was the first OPEC state to start to move oil sales into euros away from dollars. So these were, even though uh, Saddam Hussein himself had been a collaborator with the US and had been backed by the US in the, the terrible war against Iran in the 1980s, nevertheless, he was a wild card, an independent player who be had become uh, inconvenient to the US, just as I suppose we might say Manuel Noriega in Panama had become in inconvenient to the US, which had led to the US invasion of Panama in 1989 with, with terrible consequences there. So in 2006, uh, Condoleezza Rice, then the Secretary of State of, of Washington, announced this plan for a new Middle East. It wasn't a secret. The project was given a name after the invasion of Afghanistan, after the invasion of Iraq had smashed the states of those countries, um, after Israel had been forced to withdraw from Gaza, part of occupied Palestine in 2005, but just as Israelis were about to invade Lebanon in 2006, supposedly to disarm the resistance in Lebanon, um, and failed to achieve any of those objectives. But at that time, um, and uh, this was a time when a very large part of the US military was based in the Middle East, uh, and that uh, inflated the expectations of the Israelis, I guess. Nevertheless, that invasion of Lebanon was used to announce the aim of a new Middle East where liberty would trump stability and creative chaos would be a tool. Now, this is a little counter to the the uh, North American orthodoxy, which uses these ideas of hegemonic stability. Indeed, most of the commentators rely on that idea that the US is somehow being some sort of neutral umpire and stabilizing things in the world. That is the, the orthodoxy. Nevertheless, Rice at this time downplayed that stability idea uh, in favor of liberty and the implicit violence of what she called constructive chaos, which was aimed at widespread regime change. And you can see a number of the headlines from this period, the regime change consensus for Iraq, transforming the Middle East, um, the constructive chaos of a new Middle East that Rice spoke of. Let's have a look at some brief comments by Condoleezza Rice at this time. The United States has a new policy, a strategy that recognizes that the best way to defeat the ideology that uses terror as a weapon is to spread freedom and democracy. We measure our success in the democratic revolutions that have spanned the entire world, vibrant revolutions of rose and orange and purple and tulip and cedar. The destiny of the Middle East is bound up in this global expansion of freedom. The days of thinking that this region was somehow immune to democracy are over. It is time for a new Middle East. It is time to say to those who do not want a different kind of Middle East uh, that we will prevail, they will not. Thank you very much. So had the US had its way, had everything gone its way um, in the early 21st century, um, was there going to be a repartition of the Middle East? Some commentators spoke of a renewal of the British-French agreement, which had tried to divide and rule the period, uh, the, 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 uh, the Middle East at that time when it had taken uh, much of the territory from the old Ottoman Empire there. The, the, U the British and the French had indeed partitioned the Middle East to try and prevent the formation of power blocks there and to keep their influence in, in the world. Um, for example, the creation of um, Lebanon as a confessional state separate from Syria, for example. Uh, the division of the Levant from Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, um, earlier attempts to have a divided Syria with little tribal areas, a Druze area, an Alawi area, a Sunni area, and so on. That whole idea of dividing and rule in Iraq, in Syria, um, re-emerged. And the Pentagon's CENTCOM, the Central Command, which is uh, arrogates to its self-control of the most of the Middle East area, excluding Turkey, which is considered part of NATO and almost part of Europe, 
But if you look at the graph at the bottom right there, you can see the Pentagon arrogates to itself its central command, a, uh, a role to control uh, much of the Middle East there. So apart from this sort of crude imperialism, those plans were criticised for assuming that the people would forget achievements of modern states and revert to some sort of natural tribal identities. In reality, many of these states are, are modern states which see themselves with uh, national identities such as Iraqi and Syrian, just in the way that the Europea Europeans see themselves as British or French or the North Americans call themselves Americans. Um, and Patel spoke of the flawed narrative of ethnic and sectarian partition as a natural solution to regional conflicts. Nevertheless, the game was indeed to divide Iranians from Arabs or at a later stage Sunnis from Shia. In other words, there had been some sort of community divisions there, but they could be inflamed into serious sectarian divisions um, with the help of uh, this uh, old imperial strategy of divide and rule. The sectarian card and the roots of some of the biggest al-Qaeda groups in the region began in Iraq in uh, just a couple of years after the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and what was behind that was because after the destruction of the Ba'athist government in Iraq, there was a type of natural uh, reconciliation of the tensions between Iraq and Iran, as Iraq is 60 percent Shia and uh, Iran something like 90 percent Shia there was some national, na natural community um, reconciliation um, given the background of the terrible war of the 80s there. So Washington's fear was that the invasion which had uh, been aimed at weakening Iraq and bringing Iraq into a type of um, under the control of a subordinate state to the US could indeed lead to a closer relations between Baghdad and Tehran. And that was the dilemma that the Bush administration faced back in 2005. And over 2005, 2006, they planned to inflame sectarian tensions here. And some of this is written about in Seymour Hersh's very important article, The Redirection in 2007, where Hersh uh, writes that to the distress of the White House, Iran has forged a close relationship with the Shia dominated government of Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. Condoleezza Rice claimed that the Sunni states, and by that she meant the Saudis and Qatar and Bahrain, were the centres of moderation. Laughable, really, if to independent analysts of the role of the Saudis in the region for the last century. While Iran, Syria and Hezbollah were on the other side of that divide. In other words, all of the, uh, the destabilisation or the extremism came from the independent states who, in many respects, were linked to um, the Shia side of the Muslim divide, uh, conveniently ignoring Palestine, which was mainly Sunni. And of course, that was the population that was being ethnically cleansed by the key uh, forward base for the NATO powers in the region, the Israeli colony. The key players behind this redirection were the Vice President Dick Cheney, Advisor Elliot Abrahams and Prince Bandar bin Sultan, the, the key Saudi diplomat in the US at that time. And that was said to be a victory for the Saudi line within um, the Washington strategy. Um, soon after that, um, there was a discovery by the US military of uh, a lot of documents from um, the, recruit, the, foreign, the recruitment of foreign fighters for what was called Al Qaeda in Iraq or the Islamic State in Iraq back in 2006, 2007. And the biggest group of foreign fighters coming into Iraq was from Saudi Arabia. You see in the graph at the bottom left there that Saudi Arabia had the biggest uh, foreign fighters group coming into the country, followed by Libya, followed by Yemen, Syria, um, Algeria, other parts of the Middle East and North Africa there. Now, in 2012, that Al Qaeda in Iraq, ISI became ISIS in Syria as it moved across from Iraq into Syria. So, in other words, the sectarian card to try and create um, violent divisions and confrontations between Sunni and Shia communities was something that was created in Iraq to try and alienate Iraq from Iran. And still, it's an ongoing project there. Um, the, the the terrible bombing of mosques in in uh, in Iraq at that time did in many respects and was aimed to set off that sort of sectarian tension and so keep things divided. And we see later on the same type of idea was behind 
the use of the al-Qaeda groups in Syria. So along comes 2011, the so-called Arab Spring, which is one of a, a, a series of um, really uh, color revolutions, you know, including uh, those of Eastern Europe, but also this, the so-called Cedar Revolution of Lebanon in 2005 and so on. One of these badly named um, periods, which um, carries supposedly homogenous aims, um, even though there were indeed a, an uprising of claims for political reform in many states, but rather unevenly across the region. We, I think, better understand it as a second phase of the new Middle East wars, because in reality, um, it didn't really represent much of what it was said to represent in Western media terms. It was a second phase of these new Middle East wars where the strategy, the grand strategy, took the opportunity of these reform movements over 2010, 2011, um, to uh, seize on the attempts to capture some more of these independent states. So in the outcome, we see Tunisia saw some reforms, for example. Egypt reverted to a type of status quo, um, a, a type of military regime, but with some renewed concern about uh, being opposed to Muslim Brotherhood and sectarian forces in the region. There was a brief uprising in Bahrain, one of the Persian Gulf monarchies, um, you know, but the least democratic Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf were untouched by and large. Um, from 2011, however, Washington, with the support of these least democratic Arab regimes in the Arab League, pursued proxy wars against the two most progressive Arab countries, Libya and Syria. And the key to those interventions was the use of sectarian Islamists backed by NATO and backed by its propaganda wars. Well, in the outcomes, Libya was crushed by a NATO invasion, but Syria fought on, eventually supported by Iran and Russia. And the one successful revolution in Yemen led to a brutal US-backed and Saudi Arabia-led war, which began to fail in 2018. So let's look at those, some of those in a little bit more detail. The destruction of Libya in 2011, first of all. In some key elements of this, because Libya had always been a source of irritation to Washington, to, the, to NATO, um, because of its backing for the Palestinian movement, because of its independent stance in many respects, um, because of its independent stance in terms of the organization of African states and the attempt to create a, an African currency to denominate oil sales, for example. Libya was a small, in many respects, soft target at this time. Now, Qatar and Qatar's media agency, Al Jazeera, backed the Al-Qaeda style insurgency in Eastern Libya, Islamist sectarianism. It wasn't a claim for political reform at all. It was a demand for an Islamic state, which didn't happen, but nevertheless was a convenient tool to smash the state there. There were fake claims later retracted in many respects of civilian massacres, and that led to the, uh, the co-option of the UN Security Council in one of its um, very few, um, uh, perhaps its only intervention using Chapter 7 powers to authorise military force. That resolution was abused by NATO by bo to bomb and destroy the state and to help in the murder of Gaddafi, the Libyan leader. The oil wealth was carved up, but no effective state even was created even a decade later on. So what were the sins of Libya? Well, Libya had backed the Palestinian cause. It wasn't integrated into the US AFRICOM uh, and so-called anti-terrorist wars, and it was pushing for an African Union gold currency. Um, after the destruction of Libya, there was a surprisingly frank admission of the failures of the project and the false pretext of the project. Um, a, an article by Alan Cooperman in a US journal in 2015 admitted that Gaddafi's crackdown on the insurrection in Benghazi was much less lethal than suggested, that it, there had been a uh, refrain from indiscriminate violence of the about 1,000 deaths in the first seven weeks, only about 3% were women and children, and then 10,000 deaths 
with the NATO intervention. Gaddafi indeed had pledged no reprisals in Benghazi and there was no evidence or reason, Cooperman says, to support the claim that he planned mass killings. When the government forces were about to regain the east of the country, NATO intervened and another 10,000 died. What were the consequences of this terrible intervention? Um, well, there were sub-imperial ambitions. France, under then President Sarkozy, certainly wanted to gain a greater share of Libyan oil production to increase French influence in North Africa to improve Sarkozy's internal political situation. Um, it gave the French military an opportunity to reassert its position to address the concern um, Gaddafi's plans to supplant France as a dominant power in Francophone Africa posed. Um, Amnesty International, um, particularly the French chapter, um, backtracked on its claims against uh, its, its alleged human rights claims against Gaddafi. President Obama admitted it was the worst mistake of his presidency. Uh, hundreds of refugees were later reported being sold into slave markets across Libya. Uh, Libya was in ruins a decade later, still in ruins. 20 years of progress in human development were wiped out. Libya had been the country probably with the highest living standards in Africa. You look at the UNDP's chart there on the Human Development Index, Libya's uh, decline was catastrophic at that time. Let's look at a brief summary of the, the outcomes of this humanitarian intervention in Libya. The resolutions passed against Libya are based on various allegations. Notably on the statement claiming that Gaddafi had led jet attacks on his own people and engaged in a violent repression against an uprising, killing more than 6,000 civilians. Mercenaries shooting people in the eastern city of Benghazi. It's entouré d'un corps de mercenaires payé grassement. African mercenaries. Geneviève Garrigos claimed she had information regarding foreign mercenaries working on the side of the Libyan army. This claim will also be presented by the Dr. Sliman Bouchouigir in the United Nations Human Rights Council. These mercenaries seem to have carte blanche to pillage and kill uh, all civilians without distinction. Nevertheless, five months later, and after an inquiry by Donatella Rovera in Libya, the position of Geneviève Garrigos is entirely different. Ça a surtout été des rumeurs qui ont été colportées avec des accusations vis-à-vis -vis de personnes qui soit étaient de peau foncée, voire noire, et qui pouvaient être des Libyens, parce qu'on oublie que les Libyens du Sud peuvent, ne sont pas forcément de, de type arabe, et ou d'autre part des étrangers, ce qui a créé une espèce de, de peur, de xénophobie, et certains ont été maltraités, voire battus. Bon, que certains ont été emprisonnés et aujourd'hui, force est de constater qu'on n'a pas de preuves concrètes d'utilisation de forces mercenaires par le par Kadhafi. But broadening our military mission to include regime change would be a mistake. The task that I assigned our forces to protect the Libyan people from immediate danger and to establish a no-fly zone carries with it a UN mandate and international support. The real intention of the operation was revealed shortly thereafter, however, in a joint op-ed in the pages of the International Herald Tribune penned by Obama, Cameron, and Sarkozy. Our duty and our mandate under UN Security Council Resolution 1973 is to protect civilians, and we are doing that. It is not to remove Gaddafi by force, they wrote in their editorial. But it is impossible to imagine a future for Libya with Gaddafi in power. It is unthinkable that someone who has tried to massacre his own people can play a part in their future government. The attack began when Gaddafi was fleeing CERT in a convoy of 75 vehicles. Drone pilots at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada launched a round of Hellfire missiles from a Predator drone aircraft, destroying the lead vehicle and prompting a French bomber to release two laser-guided 500-pound bombs into the center of the convoy. British SAS troops, meanwhile, coordinated the ground forces that eventually captured Gaddafi. So let's examine a little bit uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 in 2011. This is the first implementation, as I said, of this responsibility to protect or a humanitarian intervention using Chapter 7 powers 
of the United Nations or abusing those powers, really, because the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 talked about intervention, but it was to protect civilians with a so-called no-fly zone. And indeed, in the first instances, the um, Obama and the others had talked about um, that they could not use it for regime change. That would be an obvious abuse, but then they did. So uh, the problem with that is that the exposure of the abuse of that power, uh, it's been criticized intellectually, but the most important rejection of that was that the, the UK, the US and France, which had wanted to use it against Libya and use it against Libya, effectively betrayed the trust that the other two permanent members of the Security Council, China and Russia, had placed in them for that. Maybe it was wrong-headed, maybe it was naive for China and Russia to agree to it in that case. But in any case, they refused to go along with it in relation to Syria. And that it could not be used again. Uh, the US tried, it wanted to use against Syria, but um, China and Russia rejected that. And that in turn created a pretty much permanent split in the Security Council. Uh, on the one hand, unable to prevent new Middle East wars driven by the NATO powers. On the other hand, the, the NATO powers led by Washington could not use the Security Council anymore to um, pursue its new Middle East wars. So let's turn now to the long, dirty war on Syria from 2011 until the present day, a decade of war and with the most convoluted and complex pretexts of all of these illegal wars of aggression. Uh, I'm going to go through a few stages of this because, in a sense, people probably take them all too seriously. But nevertheless, let's look at the various pretexts and the actual background there. First of all, the Arab Spring myths say that peaceful protesters were repressed by the Syrian regime, and there were indeed political reform demonstrations. And But that movement was rapidly, very rapidly hijacked by a violent NATO-backed Islamist Al-Qaeda insurrection. And seeing that, the reform movement within Syria reverted to backing the state and the Syrian Arab army, the nationalist army, very, very quickly, within a matter of months. But the myths um, outside Syria stayed around for a very long time because of the media, because of the state-sponsored, state-funded NGOs and uh, the corporate media backing the wars, all of the new Middle East wars. Here's a few dissident Western books, one of them mine, The Dirty War on Syria 2016, Stephen Gowan's book, Washington's Long War on Syria, um, published in 2017. Um, and Ab Abrams' book in 2021 called World War in Syria. And my book, uh, The Dirty War in Syria, documents the dirty wars from Latin America to the New Middle East. And in Syria, it says that the cover story was NATO and the Gulf monarchy supporting a secular and democratic revolution. Well, while the actual process was the US and its allies or client states taking cover of a political reform movement to launch a sectarian insurrection. Stephen Gowans, focusing on US sources more, writes that the US had waged a long war against Syria uh, from the, the late 40s, really, from its independence um, until uh, through the 60s. And that Washington had always sought to purge Arab nationalist influence from the Arab world more broadly, uh, not least because it was protecting its key colony, its key forward base in occupied Palestine. Abrams looks at the war also from uh, converging imperial rationales, uh, the history of imperialism in, in relation to Syria and more generally. And he talks about these rationales as eliminating the final vestige of Arab nationalism in the Middle East to isolate Iran and cripple Hezbollah to, in other words, cut that nexus across uh, the region so as to protect Israel, to remove the Iran-Syria links um, and providing alternative gas supplies for Europe, in other words, so that European links to the Middle East are not normalized, to further partition and so strategically isolate China and Russia and Iran to prevent those links forming between uh, the big powers to the north and to the east and uh, Iran, the big power in the region, and 
fifthly, to create a new launch pad for jihadist mercenaries who could be used against other NATO adversaries. In other words, the same sectarian groups used against Iraq and Syria could be used against Iran and also to destabilize Afghanistan as a important base in Central Asia for the US trying to contain the westward expansion of China through its Belt and Road project. So that's a bit of an overview. The Syrian revolution myths begin with, as I said, to some extent, a genuine reform movement, but infiltrated by a sectarian Islamist group at, at the Syrian level based in the Muslim Brotherhood um, secret factions and then supported from outside by what was at first called Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Syria or in Western Syria. And this is before ISIS came across from Iraq into the east. So while there were secular dissidents, the extremist Salafists very quickly came to dominate this revolution with genocidal slogans, Christians to Beirut, Alawites to the grave. Now those slogans were reported in the English language press from Homs as early as April, 2011. So just weeks into this process. Um, even though much, much later on, the peaceful protests are uh, being repressed by the violent state regime, was still in train, in fact, in, in many respects, in many arms of the media that's still there. The atrocities of the sectarian Islamists well before ISIS came into Syria revolted the Syrian people, and that's why most of them fell back to support the army and the state, whatever their concerns about the Ba'ath Party and corruption and so on, and whatever their demands for reform. Only a very small part of the nationalist Syrian Arab armory defected. That was initially a aim of the um, of the Muslim Brotherhood Syrian fact, Salafist factions, the Syrian sectarian factions. And after the insurrection was crushed in Dara and then in Homs, the revolution addressed itself to more Western audiences. So you can see all of these signs written in the English language, which most people in Syria can't read, are aimed at trying to incite further interventions in that Islamist insurrection. And that includes the false flag massacres, the fake chemical weapons claims and so on. They were aimed at Western audiences to try and get Libyan styled intervention in Syria, which of course failed at the Security Council level because Russia and China having been fooled once over Libya, were not going to make that same mistake again. How it actually began. Um, so the myth begins with the arrests of some teenagers doing graffiti in Dara, but the media reports from that time show that the weapons were being transported to Syria from the Saudis via Iraq before the violence. So we have, for example, a Reuters report from February, uh, sorry, early March um, in before the major violence in Dara, saying that weapons were being captured, smuggled from Iraq. And later on, we find that weapons were captured at Dara's al Amari Mosque. Um, that, that was the core of the uh, attacks on the, the armed attacks on civilians and the army there. And we have reports from Syria, but also from Lebanon and also from Israel at the time that many policemen were being killed. So there's early reports in March um, for example, in Lebanon, saying that seven Syrian policemen were killed. So this was not the acts of uh, peaceful protesters at this time. And at the same time, you have Al Jazeera, the, the arm of Qatar, which was financing the sectarian Islamists, inciting genocidal hatred towards Syrian Alawites, because part of the propaganda was that the Syrian government was an Alawite regime and run by a minority, in other words, because the president, Assad himself, was an Alawi, ignoring the fact that his wife was a Sunni Muslim and that Syria had for decades been committed to a pluralist state and a nationalist identity. So some of the sources for those early reports are given there. In 2011 and more in 2012, there were a series of terrible massacres um, of groups in villages, also in Damascus, which were falsely blamed on the Syrian army. And I want to pay attention to one of these in particular, the one, the Hula massacre, because the Hula massacre of early 2012 was uh, key to the imposition of uh, economic siege measures against Syria, what was called sanctions, unilateral sanctions. They weren't Security Council sanctions. They were unilateral 
effectively illegal sanctions, but nevertheless, the US managed to get support from many Western countries to uh, impose an economic blockade on Syria, which lasted for almost a decade. So in May 2012, as the armed groups were being driven out of Homs city, they committed several massacres, actually, one of these in the village of Hula, and then blamed it on unnamed thugs, Shabiha, ghosts supposedly, working for the Syrian government. Now, there may well be militia working with the Syrian government. There are indeed um, reserve militia and others who support the government and who were mobilised to, to uh, help fight against these armed sectarian groups. But anyway, this particular massacre was blamed on those pro-government forces. Now, the Western media and even a UN group co-chaired by a US diplomat, which was a clear conflict of interest, given that the US was already backing armed groups at this time, adopted and repeated the armed group's false story. But eyewitnesses told Syrian, Russian, Dutch and German media that the Farouk Brigades, which was the largest Muslim Brotherhood sectarian Islamist group at that time, a sub-branch of the so-called Free Syrian Army, which was really just an umbrella for arms and money and so on, and local collaborators were responsible. They, these witnesses gave the names of the killers and why certain families were targeted and others were not. The families that were targeted, it wasn't uh, just to do with their sect. It was because certain families had participated, for example, in the recent um, Congress elections and the constitutional referendum that was held early in 2012. The massacre was then used Blamed on, falsely blamed on the army, used to impose these Western sanctions. Other similar false flag massacres were committed and used to blame the Syrian government in, a, in further attempts to gain Western intervention. So some of them, however, were exposed by Western journalists. So one in Damascus, in the southern suburbs of Damascus, Daraya, was exposed by the late British journalist Robert Fisk, and another one in Akrab uh, was exposed by British journalist Alex Thompson. So they all said, shared the same pattern, slaughter civilians. The one in Doraya was uh, a prisoner exchange which failed and civilians were slaughtered. And then the Islamists blamed the Syrian government or Assad and a loyal Western media would repeat those claims. Now, because the Hula massacre is singular in terms of its impact politically, I wanna show just a short video to give you an idea of some of the witnesses um, who uh, exposed that. But the regime is also known to deploy the Shabiha, meaning ghosts in Arabic, armed thugs loyal to President Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> Residents say the Hula massacre on May 25th that UN observers confirm killed 108 people began with shelling from the Syrian army. But it was Shabiha, they say, who plundered the town at night, committing most of the murders. Uh, the Syrian uh, government has, uh, of course, publicly said that they're, they have, the results of their investigation into last week's massacre in Hula has found that uh, armed rebels are responsible, they say, for the deaths of more than 100 people there. Latest massacre in Hula is just one more example because it's this exact scenario that the U.S. has used to justify quote, humanitarian intervention. Al Jazeera is a liar. It's clear to all people now. Nobody believes that the army did that because we saw by our own eyes. Those terrorists set fire on my house. They terrorized us. We were unable to go outside. I came to the house and found it burnt up. The terrorists are from this area and all the areas around. There was a huge number of them, hundreds. They started to use shells and RPGs. Еще одна группа собрались для атаки второго блокпоста, расположенного на горе. Вторая группа бандитов была из клана Аль-Халяка. Он звонил еще, когда это только все началось. Когда боевики напали на блокпост, у них было убито более 25 человек. С ним были еще две группы. Группа из деревни Акраба во главе с Яхья Аль-Юсов и группа из деревни Фарлаха. Во время нападения на блокпост Недаль Бакур попросил одного боевика встать около мечети и оттуда сделать несколько выстрелов из РПГ и миномета в сторону армии, чтобы спровоцировать армию в ответ выпустить снаряды по мечети.